I appreciate the opportunity last week to be in South Dakota with our family. Uh, my middle son, Caleb, graduated with his master's uh, with mechanical engineering and engineering management, which was a great celebration. And we got to be with our grandkids and go to a reptile museum. And so uh, we got the whole gamut of uh, family experience with grandparents and everything. So, and I know Patient was here and did a fantastic job. It's so good to have uh, good, strong uh, quality men uh, s- surrounding, you know, the ministry and allows us to, uh, to, to, to expand our work and, 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 uh, and, and keep growing. I, I so appreciate what Patient's doing over at the garage. Um, and we just celebrate with them. And uh, we get to hear from next week, Jeff Copeland, uh, who is uh, with the garage as well. So I'm excited to be able to share the pulpit with those guys a little bit. Uh, we're going to be in um, John 13. It's a chapter I'm going to deal with today as we go through the Gospel of John. Uh, but there are, there are um, some things that, that to, to, in order to understand the current, you've got to understand the past. You understand that, right? There are some things that that you face in the moment that gain more clarity if you understand what's come before. Uh, and so, in 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 light of that, and as right before we get into John thirteen, I want to set the stage with what has has happened before. Right, right. I think verse twenty seven or verse thirty seven of John twelve. Uh, let, let me just set up John thirteen with with this. This is a warning. And an implied blessing in John 12, 37. This is what the Bible says. Even after Jesus had done all these miraculous signs in their presence, they still would not believe in him. Even after Jesus had done all these miraculous signs in their presence, they they, they saw what Jesus did. They watched him, they heard him, they experienced, they still wouldn't believe. As, as I look at the Gospel of John, and I talked about this in the first few weeks, that John at this point, John was the, the oldest, uh, oldest apostle. He lived the longest, 93 years old or so. And he had seen all the other apostles, except for Judas, saw all the others uh, believe, follow Jesus, and be martyred for their faith. He saw nearly the first century of, of the church and, and, and watch them and, and watch them walk through what it meant to believe in this risen Messiah. And, and he's an old man, and, he, and he's, he's in essence, he's looking back thinking, over all the things. I was with Jesus the longest. I saw him do the most out of all the and I'm the oldest. I'm still, after all I've seen Jesus do, I'm gonna pick some of them and I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna write these down. And he tells us the purpose of the of writing the Gospel of John. It's these things are written that you might believe. And so everything we see in John has the purpose of prompting in us and calling in us to believe in Jesus as the Messiah. And knowing that, this verse is profound for me. Even after Jesus had done all these miraculous signs in their presence, they still would not believe in him. Here's what I know. And this is a, this is a theological truth that you have to understand. It's, I see in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. A hard heart makes a hardened heart. Here's what I mean. God ratifies the decisions of your heart. And when we choose not to believe, we cannot believe. A hard heart makes a hardened heart. Here's what I know. They did not believe, so then they could not believe. They'd chosen disbelief so long They're unable to believe. God allowed a hard heart to become a hardened heart. And I see this even in the Old Testament. You go back to the uh, the story of the the Exodus. Uh, and, and, And all of God's people are in captivity in Egypt. And God sends all these miracles to Pharaoh and the land. And the Bible says of Pharaoh that when God started to relent, the Bible says in Exodus 8, 15 and 8, 32, Pharaoh hardened his heart. And then in Exodus 9, 12, and 10, 20, it later says, and God hardened Pharaoh's heart. Which came first? Pharaoh chose to harden his heart. And because Pharaoh chose to harden his heart, God ratified that decision and made his heart hard. Do you understand that? And so these people, 
They, even after all they said, they, they, they chose not to believe. And they did not believe, so now they could not believe. That's the warning. Here's what I know. The more and more and more that we tell God no, the easier and easier it is to tell God no. You follow me? Now, the, the opposite of that is true too. There's an implied blessing in that. All you got to do is start saying yes to God. And the moment you say yes to God, it gets easier to say yes the next time. And that's why Jesus and Scripture always calls us to times of commitment. Because God will ratify the heart that we've chosen. If I choose to say no to God, no to God, no to God, God will ratify that decision and pretty soon my heart becomes hardened because I've hardened it and God's ratified that. And likewise, if I choose to say yes to God, it becomes easier to say yes to God and God ratifies that decision in me. The great thing about this is that I get to choose. All I have to do is start doing the saying yes, and God starts to ratify that. And so here's my encouragement. Keep or start saying yes. Some people have said no to God for so long. It's so easy for you to keep saying no. Start saying yes. I, I have to set that table before we get into John 13 because John 13 is awesome, profound, and difficult. And so let me lead us in prayer. Father, it is clear that you ratify the heart we choose. My prayer this morning is real simple. Holy Spirit, that when you prompt, when you prod, when you convict, when you start to speak, that we would say yes. And when we say yes, ratify that decision and strengthen that decision in our heart. And for that, Father, we give you thanks. In your name I pray, amen. Chapters 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, the next six chapters deal with one night. The, the next six chapters deal with, with the last night of Jesus' life before he's, he's, he's arrested and crucified. Nearly half the gospel of John is about the last night of his, his arrest, crucifixion, and then through the crucifixion, resurrection. Nearly half of the gospel is about that. Why? Because that's the important part. There's a lot we don't know about Jesus as a life. We don't know what he was like as a toddler. We don't know what he was like as a teenager. We don't know junior high Jesus. We don't know what Jesus was like when he turned 16 and learned how to drive a camel. Like there's a lot there we don't know on. And the reason we don't know, because it's not important. Because the purpose of John's letter is to write the things that will help us believe. And it's all centered on the cross and his resurrection. And so the majority of the gospel is about that. And so for the next six chapters, it deals with one night. Jesus had, is recorded for us, it four great discourses, messages to his people. John, through this chapter, we will see the longest discourse of Jesus ever recorded. Because these final moments are the important ones. John 13 is, is, is primarily about Jesus washing the disciples' feet. But again, to understand the, 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 the part of the power of that, we got to understand what's come before. So what's come before is, is, is John 12, verses 1, 2, and 3. And in John 12, verses 1, 2, and 3, we read the account of Jesus' feet being washed. And so then John 13, we read the account of Jesus washing feet. Jesus' feet was washed, he was ministered to, he was served, and then he washed feet. He ministered and he served. And this is the relationship, this is the, this is the flow of faith that I am served and ministered to, and then I serve and I minister. It can never be a one-way thing. I am served and ministered to, and then I serve and minister. This is the truth of the Sea of Galilee and the Dead Sea. The Sea of Galilee is one of the most populous, fruitful bodies of water in that whole part of the world. It is abundant with fish, and the Jordan River runs down through it and goes into the Dead Sea. The, 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 Jordan, the, the Sea of Galilee has these rivers feeding it, and then it flows out through the Jordan River and goes into the Dead Sea. The Dead Sea is dead. That's why they named it that. Do you know why it's dead? 
No, there's no outlet. It receives, 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 and just sits. And anytime you receive, 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 and sit, you die. So Jesus received this worship and this adoration, this service by having his feet washed, and then he served. It went out. Do you understand? We got to understand that about faith. We got to understand that about our lives. We got to understand that. When any of us come and just sit and serve and receive, and don't then give it out. We think we're growing and we're dying. And so that leads us to John 13, verse 1. The Bible says, go to verse 1. It was just before the Passover feast. Jesus knew that the time had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he now showed them the full extent of his love. His public ministry is done. He spent three years in public ministry. He has said all he needed to say. He had done all he needed to do. He had performed all the miracles and all the signs he needed to perform and, and, and do. It was His public ministry was done. And I like in this moment right here, in my world, the world of football, this is like a head coach meeting with his team for a pregame speech. All the prep is done. All the practice is done. All the film study is done. Now it's me and my guys. And we're going to get ready to go play the game now. And so it's him and he's prepping them. The Bible says that just before the Passover feast, Jesus knew that his time had come for him to leave this world. Back in those days, when when people would eat a regular meal, they just sat down and ate like no big deal. But there were the special meals, the intimate meals, the feasts that were intimate in nature, and they would recline at a table. And we'll read about that in a moment. And it's, it's, the, it's these intimate moments when we're reclining, and they would take hours upon hours to go through this. And what they believed is that in the intimacy of those meals, it, it's such a personal thing that when I take food and partake and pass it to you and you partake, that our lives are becoming intertwined with each other because what I'm giving you becomes part of your being. This was a real intimate moment. And this is why Paul says uh, in, for the people in the church, if you got someone in your church who professes to be Christian but lives in habitual, unrepentant sin, he says don't even eat with them. He's not saying don't associate with them. He, he's not saying don't be around them. He's saying don't share an intimacy with them because the Bible says good comp- or bad company corrupts good character and it's going to rub off the intimacy And so this is a really intimate moment he's sharing with his disciples. Their lives are being intertwined with each other. Verse 2, 3, and 4, look what the Bible says. The evening meal was being served. Will you just follow along back there with me? Thank you. Uh, The evening meal was being served, and the devil had already prompted Judas Iscariot, son of Simon, to betray Jesus. So he had already made the deal with the priest. He had already made the deal. 30 pieces of silver, I'll hand them over. So that's done. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the mill, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. To understand, again, to understand the power and the, and the force of this passage, we got to understand the other issues flowing around it. And so if, if, you, if, you, if, you, go, if you were to go to Luke uh, chapter 22, I'll just read it for you. This is what was happening during this time before Jesus took off his robe and, 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 and was going to serve him. This is what was happening. Luke twenty two twenty four 24 says this, A dispute, an argument rose up among the disciples as to which one of them was considered to be greatest. They want to know the pecking order. They want to know who's at the front of the line. Jesus said to them, the kings of the Gentiles lorded over them, and those who exercise authority over them call themselves benefactors. But you are not to be like that. There's a flip side to this authority thing. Instead, the greatest among you should be like the youngest, and the one who rules like one who serves. It's in that context that Jesus takes off his outer clothes, puts a towel around his waist, and is going to serve. See, the Bible says that God has put all authority under his discretion. He's been given all authority. All things are under his power. And what does he choose to do with that much authority and power? What does he choose to do? 
serve. Why? One of the reasons because they were just arguing about who was greater. Because if I'm greater than you, you have to serve me. And Jesus says, let me show you a picture of what I'm talking about, of what the kingdom is. It's different than that. Jesus knew his time. He knew that all things would be given to him. See, acts of love only come from a secure person. Acts of selfishness come from an insecure person. We've got to understand this, that, uh, that, that, that you, were sa- you weren't saved to be a sensation. You were saved to serve. We weren't saved to be a sensation. Look at me, look at me. It's just part of my beef with social media. Everything about social media is about making me a sensation. The greatest sensation in the history of everything was in their midst. And he served. We don't need more sensations. Right? More servants. See, there was so much freedom. When when, when you have power, you're secure, and you don't have anything to prove. There's so much freedom in living as though you got nothing to prove and no one to impress. And when that's your heart, you can serve. It's interesting to me that, that, that John records that Jesus took off his outer clothes and wrapped himself in a towel. What's happening here, there's, there's a deeper level of what's going on here because we will know from the Apostle Paul in Philippians 2 that likewise Jesus took off his outer robe of the heavenly and put on the towel of humanity and humility. He's given us a picture of what he's going to do on the cross. Taking off the heavenly, putting on in humility the robe of humanity, and serve. Even in verse 5, look at verse 5. After that, he poured water into the basin, began to wash the disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was around his waist. Look at the picture. He pours out in order to clean. On the cross, what was he going to do? He was going to pour out his blood in order to cleanse humanity of sin. He said, I'm giving you a picture of why I'm here so that you might believe. Say yes to me. There's so much going on. And I love Peter's response. Verses 6, 7, and 8. Look at what Peter says. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, you you don't realize what I'm doing right now. Later you'll understand. Here's what I know. Faith, we don't see faith in the the windshield. We see faith through the rearview mirror, right? Like like it makes sense looking back. And that's what Jesus is saying right here. Like you're not going to understand it going forward. You're going to understand it when you look back. But let me just tell you this, Peter. You're going to wash your feet. And Peter says, look at what it says in verse 9. No, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered, unless I wash you, you have no part in me. Here's what I love about Peter. I, I, I identify with Peter a lot. Here's what it is. Peter loves to tell God no. He loves to tell God no. This was the habit of Peter's life. You, you go back to Matthew 16, and Jesus tells his disciples, look, I'm going to go to the cross and die and be resurrected. And Peter's like, oh, no, you're not going to do that. In the Garden of Gethsemane, the soldiers come and arrest to arrest Jesus. And Peter says, oh, no, no, you ain't, and gets his sword and whacks off a guy's ear. Even after the resurrection, Peter's lounging at the, you know, having a little siesta in the afternoon, has a dream. God brings this, 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 this sheet down with all this, you know, bacon and tri-tip and all this good and, and lobster and stuff. And, and God says, go ahead and eat. And Peter says, no, God, I'm not going to eat. No, huh? no, no, no. Peter loved to tell God no. And so do we. Why did Peter always want to tell God no? I'll tell you why. Because Peter thought he knew better. He had a better plan. And the reason why you and I tell God no is because we think we know better. We've got a better plan of what to do with our dating life. We've got a better plan of what to do with our money. We've got a better plan of what to do with my schedule and my free time. We've got a better plan. 
And so when we think we have a better plan, we tell God no. And the more we tell God no, the more God ratifies that heart. Do you understand? So here's the question for me and you. What am I, what are you saying no to God about? Every one of us is something. What are you saying no to God about? Let's please all of us be careful. I mean, I'm realizing the arrogance in me to tell God no. To think I know better. I might not understand I might have trouble trusting, granted. But I need to get in the habit of saying yes, even in my, under, in my, my not understanding. Peter says, oh, no, 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 you're not, you're not going to do that. Jesus says, unless I wash you, you've got no part of me. And then Peter being Peter, verse 9, oh, then Lord, uh, Simon Peter replied, not just my feet, but my hands and head as well. It's like, go, go ahead, give me a shower then. Jesus answered, a person who's had a bath needs only to wash his feet. The whole body's clean, and you are clean, though not every one of you. And then verse 11, for he knew who was going to betray him. Now, now the context of, of what Jesus is saying, he's saying, look, you've already had a bath. You, you've already, it is the Greek word luo, which means you've already been immersed and clean. You don't need to do that again. I mean, that song that Jeff sings is beautiful. I've been washed in the blood. I've already been immersed and cleansed. I got a relationship because of the blood of Jesus. He says, you don't need to do that again, but you do need to tiptoe, which means spot clean. You, you do, there's just little parts of you that, that had to be cleaned up. See, back in this, in this culture, they had dirt roads and open-toed shoes. And animals use the same roads as people. And you know what happens when an animal's got to go, an animal's got to go. And you're walking around in the heat of the day and, and on these dirt roads and open-toed shoes and, and you want to talk about toe jam. I mean, it's just nasty. It's just nasty. And so what they would do, they have the lowest servant they could get, the lowest of the low of the low, to be the one at the door for these intimate settings to wash feet. They didn't need a whole shower. They just had some dirt on them that had to be cleaned off. You understand that, right? And so Jesus is saying, look, you're all, like, we're already good. But you walk around in a dirty world, in a dirty culture, and it attaches itself to you. There's things in your life that you got on you right now that you need to let me clean up. Jesus said, I don't want to keep smelling your stinky feet when you're trying to get close to me. The, the, the truth is that as we go through this world, we pick up the dirt around us and we need a daily spot cleaning. If you confess your sin, God is faithful and just to cleanse you and purify you. Not for salvation, but for fellowship. And the thing that blows me away about this is verse 11. For he knew, Jesus knew, who was going to betray him. He already knew. He already knew the, 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 the deal that Judas made with the priest. He already knew that there had been an exchange of money, an agreement to betray. He already knew what was in Judas's heart. And in knowing that and having all authority in heaven and earth given to him, what did he do to Judas? took off his authority, he wrapped on humility, and he washed his feet. <sighs> this Jesus, man, he is like no other. 14, 15, and 16, now that I, your, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash another's, one another's feet. I've set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. 
I tell you the truth, no servant is greater than his master, nor a messenger greater than the one who sent him. He says, look, I am the master, and you're not greater than me, and if I've done this, you need to do it too. He's saying, you don't get out of this. I've set you an example. You do as I have done. Do as I've done. The first thing I want to drive home is this. If we claim to be Christ followers, we need to think in terms of this idea. I must now become a person of the towel. I must now, because he set the example, become a person of the towel. Take off my authority, put on humility, and serve. Not only that, but the reason why Jesus washed their feet is, is what? Now, guys, listen, don't overthink it. It's a really simple answer. The reason why Jesus washed their feet is what? Because they had dirty feet. He's not washing them to give them a massage like a little cucumber water and make them feel good. He's washing their feet because they're dirty. And in the Bible, dirt, filth, is representative of sin. So what he's saying here, when one is caught with some dirt and sin on them, we, in humility, wash them and help them come back into fellowship. Do you understand what I'm saying? See, here's our problem. Most of the time, when we have the opportunity to walk with someone through the filth of life and help them get clean. We, we do it, in, in, unfortunately, in one of three different ways. Sometimes we like to help people get cleaned up with scalding hot water. Because we want to make sure they feel the pain of what they've done. Other times we like to wash people's feet with like ice cold water, where it's just impersonal and the law, and this is just what it is. Deal with it. But there are some who like helping people get cleaned up with a Brillo pad and no water at all. And they're just rough and mean and good. And Jesus is leading from a position of humility with great mercy and grace. And, and, and we're given parameters in Galatians 6.1. I think I have that verse, Galatians 6.1. It says, brothers and sisters, if someone's caught in a sin, and, and being caught in a sin, that's not like, aha, I caught you. It's like being wrapped in a net, and I'm, 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 I cannot free myself. When, when, you, when someone is caught in the net of sin and cannot free themselves, the Bible says, you who live by the Spirit, right, should restore that person gently. But watch out. Keep yourself clean. Don't get dirtied up with them. When it says restore them gently, it means literally step up under them. Because they got a weight on their shoulders that they can't unload. Step up under them and help them bear that up with great gentleness and mercy and grace. And that's what Jesus is talking about by washing each other's feet. Serving, helping, aiding. And, and, and I, I love verse 17. He, he says, now that you know these things, you'll be blessed if you do them. That word blessed is a Greek word called makarios, and it's been used other times in the Scripture by Jesus. It doesn't just mean blessed, it means happy. It means now that you know this stuff, you'll be happy if you do this stuff. You're not going to be happy if you know it. You're not going to be happy because you've learned it. You're not going to be happy because there's something to talk about. And he says you're going to be happy if you do it. And that word do is a verb that means the continuous doing of a thing. So as I continually do this thing of serving people, I will be happy and I will maintain a state of happiness as I continue to do these things. I've seen what Jesus has done. He's continued to do those things. So I will continue to do what I've seen Jesus do. And as I continue to do what I've seen Jesus do, I will become happy. Do you understand? I've noticed something. It's always the grumpy ones who don't serve. It's always the grumpy ones who don't serve. And, and I've asked the question, are they, do they not serve because they're grumpy? Or are they grumpy because they don't serve? Well, according to what the Bible says, they're grumpy because they don't serve. Because the Bible, Jesus just said, you'll be happy if you do this. You're serving people. 
Find somewhere. You know, we have those little serve cards with all kinds of ways to try something. But as I've looked around, it's, it's, so, it's so obvious to me. The, 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 the less people serve, the more they get used to saying no to God and invitations to serve, the grumpier they get. And pretty soon they've convinced us, well, I'm not serving because they're not blah, 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 blah. Well, you're just grumpy because you don't do anything. When my son Caleb was first year in, in, in South Dakota, some things went really, really, really horrible. Horrible. And he was fighting bitterness and depression and excruciating sadness and loneliness. And one of the things I told him, I said, son, you have got, in the midst of your pain, in the midst of your depression, in the midst of everything, you have to serve. And for six years, he served at his church, leading the sixth, fifth and sixth grade Sunday school class. My son Wyatt was going through a horrible senior year. After a football scene, it was just, it was just, it was. Yeah. He really didn't want to be do the church thing. He'd come because he would sit with his mama every Sunday, which was awesome. And he knew that was our expectation. I don't care how you're feeling, you're going to church. And we said, if you don't want to do anything else, you have to serve somewhere. And so he started leading the Monday night's uh, small group of the junior high kids. You know why? Because you'll be blessed if you do these things. And they were teetering on becoming grumpy young men. It's just Bible. I'm going to finish this up. Is that right? i got a few more things. Let me just finish this up. Verses 18 and, and 21. Uh, Jesus says, He who shares my bread has lifted up his heel against me. He's quoting Psalm 41, which is a messianic prophetic psalm about the Messiah being, being betrayed. And so he's quoting that back to them. They know what he's saying. Verse 21, After he had said this to them, Jesus was troubled in his spirit and testified, I tell you the truth, the one, uh, one of you is going to betray me. When the Bible says he was troubled, it means like we got to understand, Jesus was fully God and fully human. And in his humanity, it, his heart was hurting. You know what it's like to be betrayed. And in his humanity, he was deeply troubled. He was hurting. He was, his heart was breaking. And the thing I, I am so amazed about my Jesus is that the middle of the hurt and the betrayal that he was beginning to feel experientially in his being, he responded to Judas with gentleness and mercy and grace. Though troubled, he was not harsh. How different than me. His disciples stared at one another, a loss to know which of them he meant. One of them, the disciple whom Jesus loved, that, that's, that's code for John. John calls himself the one Jesus loved. It's a neat little nickname he gave to himself. John was reclining next to him. Simon Peter motioned to the disciple and asked, ask him which one he means. And leaning back against Jesus, he asked him, Lord, who is it? Understand what Jesus just said. One of you, he didn't point him out. One of you is going to betray me. To understand what's happening here, you've got to go back to Matthew's account. And Matthew says this. His disciples stared at one another at a loss to know. Oh, no. Go to Matthew. Now, uh, how did I get lost in this? There it is. In the Matthew's story of this, they were very sad because Jesus said, one of you is going to betray me. They, they were very sad and began to say to him one after another, surely it'll mean me, me. Do you know what that tells me? They knew what they were capable of. Jesus didn't say which one it was. He just said, one of you will. And every one of them knew. As much as they wanted to pose as the righteous, good person, every one of them knew that something was in their heart that was more than ready to tell God, no! Do you know that about yourself? Jesus 
Jesus answers, it's the one to whom I will give this piece of bread when I dip it in the dish. Then dipping the piece of bread as he, he gave it to Judas Iscariot, son of Simon. The context is they're reclining at a table because this is an intimate meal. The table system that was set up for these types of things was called a triclinium. And it was a multi-table system. And they would lean on their left shoulder, reclining on the ground, to head towards the table and towards the heart of the person to their left. And there would be a table and a table and a table and a table. About 12 people in total, 12 disciples of Jesus. And they're reclining at this meal, at this triclinium, sharing a meal with each other. And the Bible says, the one to whom I dip and pass will be the one. The interesting thing about the setup of the meal like this is the host of the meal was responsible for initiating the bread, the food, the drink, and then passing it. It started with the host, and they would pass it to the left and 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 the left. Jesus is the host. And he's leaning towards Judas. Because the Bible says, him who I pass this to will be the one. You didn't pass across the room. You didn't pass backwards. You passed to the left. So we know that Judas was sitting to Jesus' left. Here's what's significant about that. The host chose the seating arrangements because the one sitting to the left of the host was the guest of honor. Jesus purposefully sat Judas at the place of honor to honor him, to try to draw him to himself. Jesus was leaning towards the heart of Judas. Judas was leaning away from the heart of Jesus. Which way are you leaning this morning? The thing that amazes me is this Jesus was in a continual process of drawing Judas to him. Judas, I know what you've done, and yet I will put on a towel and wash your grimy feet. Judas, I know what you're capable of. I know what you've done, and yet I'm sitting you here at the place of honor. I'm leaning into you. I'm drawing you to me. Will you please just for once tell me yes? Which way are you leaning? He's drawing you and he wants you to tell him yes. How things might have changed. The end of verse 30. John says, oh, and by the way, it was nighttime. <laughs> I read that and I'm like, well, duh. I mean, you just said the evening meal had started. Of course, it's nighttime. You think I'm an adult? You got to tell me it's nighttime? Here's what I know. For John, light and darkness were profound elements. For it's in John that Jesus says, I am the light of the world. Whoever walks in me does not walk in darkness. If you don't walk in me, you do walk in darkness. And what John is saying is it was nighttime. Why? Because the deeds of the darkness are evil. It's all those things that lean away from Jesus. And those things happen in the darkness of separation. It was nighttime. Let me wrap up with this, verse 34 and 35. And this is the kicker to the whole thing. Jesus says, a new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. The thing that amazes me about this is that Jesus says, a new command I give you, love one another. This, my friends, was not a new command. You go back to the Old Testament, the book of Leviticus, the law that was given by God to Moses. Leviticus 19.18 says this, do not seek revenge or bear a grudge against one of your own people. Huh? But love your neighbors yourself. I am the Lord. This was not a new command. 
by any stretch of the imagination. But Jesus says, a new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. So it's so interesting to me because the, the Apostle John, who's an old, old, old man who ended up writing at 93 years old, 1 John, he would say the same things. Dear friends, I am not writing to you a new command, but an old one, which you have had since the beginning. This old command is the message you have heard. Yet I am writing to you a new command. It's truth you've seen in him. He's saying, look, I'm not giving you, you've had this command since the beginning. It's the, the, the command to love one another. However, it is a new command. Well, which is it, John? Is it an old command we've had from the beginning or is it a new command? John's saying it's both. It's an old command. It isn't new, but it also is a new command. What in the world are you talking about? Jesus says the same thing. I'm giving you a new command. It's not a new command. It's an old command. What's he talking about? Jesus is saying, though you've heard this command before, your ancestors have had it. It was my law from the beginning that you love one another. He says, I'm giving it to you in a new way. There is now a new quality of love. There is now a new standard of love. There is now a new extent of love. There is now a new experience of love. And as you have seen me love my Judas, you must love your Judas. Do you understand? As I have loved. You just saw how I love my Judas. A new command. Love your Judas the same. This Jesus is like no other. He says, this is how the world will, you, will know that you are my disciples. When it sees you treat your Judas the way I treated mine. And if we're expected to treat our Judas, to love our Judas like that, how much better to love those in our lives who are not our Judases? Tony, friends, this, the Christianity stuff is radical. And it's revolutionary. And I'm so thankful that God doesn't get tired of stubborn people like me learning it again and again and again. This is how much God loves us. Romans 5.8. That while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. While we were still Judases, Christ died for us. That's how much he loves us. And all he's saying is, please, will you tell me yes? Please, will you say yes to how much I love you? Because I will radicalize how you love other people. I want you to pray with me. Father, I thank you that you chose to love us while we were Judases to you. That our neglect, rejection, and nose to you never turned your heart away from us. I thank you that you continue to lean in, that you continue to pursue, and you still do. Father, I pray that those of us who had said no to you would say yes. And that as we say yes to you or radicalize and ratify our hearts. Father, some of us have Judases. And rather than loving them like you loved yours, we have turned away, allowed wedges to be driven between. We've harbored hurt. Some of us have never turned to you in the first place. So we have no hope of having a new heart. And Father, I know and you know that it's time for some of us to say yes. And so in the quietness of this moment, friends, I would encourage you just to say yes. If for the first time you need to accept Jesus as the leader of your life, I would encourage you just to say, Father, I'm sorry for my sin. Jesus, thank you that you died on the cross so I could be forgiven. I don't exactly understand what all that means, but I know I want you in my life. So I accept you as my leader. Make me new. Some of you, you've been thinking this whole morning long about things you've been saying no to God to. 
And for you, it's time to say yes. Say, Father, I'm sorry. I repent. I repent of me saying no. Give me all your grace has to give me, and I say yes. Father, I ask on our behalf that those hearts that are saying yes to you, that you would ratify the yeses. That as we say yes this first time, you'd make it easier to say yes the next time. That we begin a new, a new turn. It's called repentance. That we begin a new turn of saying yes to what you're doing. To a radical love. To love those even who have hurt us. Thank you for your example. Help us to love like you have. With your eyes closed. I just I simply ask you this. If you've made some decision to follow Jesus or to say yes. You don't have to do anything big. I just want you to look up at me. Just shoot your eyes up at me. Thank you. Thank you. God bless you. Come on. Thank you. This is one of the ways that you start saying yes. This is one of the ways you keep a, a, a soft heart, responsive. Thank you. Thank you. Good for you. Don't say yes. Don't say no anymore. You've said it enough. You know what God has asked. You know what the Spirit's prompt to think. You just say yes. Good. Father, I thank you for the yeses. Continue to ratify their heart to keep saying yes, to follow you and find true happiness and joy in a relationship with you. And for those who are still struggling with the no's, Father, I pray that you be gentle with them. But just be gentle with them. And mercy and grace win their hearts as they see you leaning into them day after day after day. We love you, Jesus. In your name I pray, amen.